days. Okay, welcome everybody. Uh, this is a meeting of the Vermont Climate Council. Um, thanks for being here with us today. Um, my name is David Plum. If this is your first time joining a, a meeting of this Vermont Climate Council, <clears throat> and my job is to just facilitate these meetings. Um, we've been dropping in the chat some links with uh, today's agenda <clears throat> and what we aim to do today. It's an exciting day because we get to hear um, what's been going on with all the public engagement and stakeholder engagement efforts um, uh, over the last month and a half or so or more. Um, and so it's something that I've been looking forward to and I hope you have too. Um, why don't we take a quick peek at our agenda? <clears throat> I just dropped it in the chat again, as did Jane. Um, I'm actually happy to share my screen with it quickly. <clears throat> this is what we're trying to do today. Um, we have to do our normal approval of minutes. Um, <clears throat> we have a very interesting just transition reflection today um, uh, with uh, Deputy Secretary from ANR, Maggie Gendron. Um, and to look at what ANR is doing on its diversity, equity, and inclusion work. Um, so I look forward to that. Um, and then the real bulk of our meeting today is hearing what's going on or what has gone on with the public engagement work. And there's three key pieces to that we have. We'll go through around what happened, what are the key findings, and what's next. All right. So that's, we're an hour and a half dedicated to that today. Um, so we really look forward to that. Um, and then we need to have a conversation at the end <clears throat> about uh, thinking about the in-person option for a meeting in November. And we want to test people's uh, views and appetite for that. Um, and we'll finish up with some public comment. We're aiming for public comment on the earlier side around 345 today um, and aiming to adjourn around four today. So that's our meeting today. Um, and let me drop screen for a second and just do a quick check in with folks. Any concerns about our agenda today? Anything we need to <clears throat> um, put on that agenda or, or anything we need to adjust before we get going? Great. Well, I'm not seeing anything from folks. That's good. Um, and welcome everybody, if you're just joining, welcome Secretary Young, thanks. We just got going, if that's okay. <clears throat> that's right, sorry to be late, jumped off another call. We figured as much, it's one of those days. All right, so let's jump into our agenda. And again, uh, feel free to uh, use those links um, in the chat to, to see additional details for this meeting. Uh, first thing, um, Review of the minutes from October 12th meeting. Again, they're hyperlinked right in that agenda. You can go right into it. Um, let's just take a pause here, let folks click through it. If anybody needs to click through one more time to look at those notes, I'll let folks do that. Okay. Would anybody, uh, does anybody have any concerns about the notes or want just a touch more time? to scan them and look at them. Any concerns about the notes? Okay, not seeing any concerns. Uh, we'll treat those <clears throat> as approved by you. Thanks so much. Um, okay, uh, so we wanna start out with our our equity reflection, our just transition reflection. And as I mentioned, Maggie's here um, from ANR to give us an overview of what ANR is doing. Um, next week, we'll have Senator Rahm talking about um, the just the EJ bill that's in, uh, in the legislature, which is very interesting as well. Um, but Maggie, um, let me just turn it over to you um, and say, we'd love to hear what's going on um, and what you're trying to lead over at ANR. Um, and then if there's some time for some comments and questions from the council, even better. So let me go ahead and turn it right over to you. Great, thank you. Um, thank you very much and good afternoon. I appreciate the time to come here and speak with all of you. Um, do you mind telling me if you can hear me? I had some issues with my 
you can. Okay, great. Um, uh, so again, thank you very much to the Climate Action um, Council Steering Committee for the invitation to speak um, today. My name is Maggie Gendron. I am the Deputy Secretary here at the Agency of Natural Resources. And um, I did not provide a formal presentation slide. I thought I would just speak to some of the work of the agency um, today in terms of our experience as we have worked to align the agency's environmental justice, uh, diversity, equity, and inclusivity pathways. Um, this work will better support our agency's mission um, which is our is our commitment to a shared responsibility to care for our environment um, and build that shared sense of place for Vermonters. Um, it's just a little bit about myself because I did uh, I did grow up in Vermont, uh, left Vermont, came back to Vermont, and um, I've largely worked in public service for most of my professional life. And I really have enjoyed working um, with Secretary Moore as the deputy for the agency. I did come from sustainable transportation of which um, we're talking a lot um, for the last 10 years over the equity of um, public transportation systems and how they either connect or disconnect communities. So that's where I was coming into this conversation from. And one of the first meetings that I had with Secretary Moore, she had, um, uh, brought up the agency's desire to see progress around our environmental justice, diversity, equity, and inclusivity work. And that was both internally and externally. And I say our agency's desire because this resolve wasn't just um, driven by Secretary Moore, but it was a conversation that was driven and led by um, uh, my colleagues at ANR. And so the departments having uh, uh, a real desire to move the work forward. So before I speak um, more, I just wanted to take a moment um, to both acknowledge and recognize the injustices that have been made through structural and institutional systems that have imposed harm to Black communities, Indigenous communities, and communities of color. And I also recognize that this is a real moment in time where both leaders and participants in government systems can shift and work will work to shift policies and the distribution and redistribution of environmental benefits and burdens for our communities. So um, the work on the Climate Action Council in particular has been really interesting for me to follow, especially the Just Transition Subcommittee and the Guiding Principles document that you all have put together. Um, I think that has really brought a level of attention and education to communities around the state. Um, I've been hearing more and more of um, the folks that I work with outside of just the bubble of government, but also within the communities that we participate in and, and people using terms that include environmental justice, climate justice and equity and, and people really trying to figure out what does that mean for them? What does that mean for their community? What is their responsibility in that? So I really value the conversations that um, this council in particular has been hosting um, uh, around the state and also regularly within yourselves. And then on, you know, kind of the, um, to pull it back a little bit, there's also this national and global conversation that's happening around climate justice and the equitable distribution of resources and the redistribution of resources and also the conversation about how action and inaction have um, disproportionately impacted our BIPOC communities. And um, that conversation is a lens in which um, ANR has been thinking about its work. And so I say all of this as a way to build some context about how I entered the conversation and then where we're headed as an agency. And I also have to say that this did not start and will not stop with me as the deputy for the secretary. This work has been happening over several years within the agency and there's a lot of commitment as I alluded to previously um, to make some real progress here. Um, so uh, um, some, some progress that I really want to celebrate this um, in this particular year is we were able to hire Carla Raimundi, who is our EJ environmental justice, when I say EJ, 
and civil rights coordinator. And she has a background that's really steeped in environmental justice work. She has supported her community um, in Puerto Rico in the aftermath of Hurricane Katrina. And she has both an academic and a real professional exposure to environmental justice work. And so we um, were able to um, onboard her over the last three months. And she has spent a considerable amount of time getting to know our agency, meeting with our agency leadership in this space. Um, we have several, um, we, we have about 20 staff members that I can think of off the top of my head who are taking leadership roles within the agency. So she's been meeting with those folks um, to have an understanding of um, what are we doing? What have we done? What kind of pathways have we started? What needs to be complete, completed? Where, what are our priorities? And so a lot of the conversation that we've been having is how the Civil Rights Act of 1964 is really the cornerstone of EJ work um, with some of the non-discrimination practices that have been incorporated into the requirements um, as a recipient of federal funding, um, the work around the limited English proficiency plans um, to be able to support our non-English speaking Vermonters and also the um, um, providing interpretation services for non-English speaking Vermonters. And so, um, so we're really at a foundation uh, moment of building blocks right now where we have procedures that we plan to put in place over the next year and beyond. It will include the prioritization of written policies, the prioritization of our standard of conduct, um, creating compliance program oversight, establishing frequent and regular trainings, um, formalizing the review and accountability of our work, and establishing loop channels of communication, all while trying to communicate um, the very real need for resources around this really important work. And those resources are both include capacity of staff, training, and the funding of all of those pieces. And so, um, we've also, in this process, have identified spaces that we would really welcome the collaboration um, from a state level. Uh, those pieces included the recruitment and retention of a more diverse state workforce, um, the needed support in the very nuanced and high quality training that is necessary for all staff, um, equity considerations and policy development. And also, again, as I, as I had um, previously spoke to, the language interpretation of documents and how we communicate to our non-English speaking communities here in Vermont. And some of that really important work is also being undertaken or considered by the Racial Equity op Office that is um, directed by Susana Davis. And she's been doing some, um, over the past year has really also been doing some really incredible work in setting the cornerstones and principles that um, we as agencies need to be thinking about as we build out our own agency policies. Um, so as, I, um, as I've been here now since January at the agency, I too have been just listening to what my colleagues uh, have been working on. The Department of Environmental Conservation has spent several years working toward uh, an environmental justice policy for the agency. And as we have gone through this process and learned, um, this, this policy really needed to be informed by the communities that it intends to serve. And so we have since um, pulled back on the drafting of a policy and have re-engaged with um, a, a community partner rejoice to support us in a listening tour, a really a community engagement effort um, in which it helps us identify um, the communities that we need to focus. We also have um, another working group within the agency that is really focusing on diversity, equity, and inclusion um, as an internal um, facing working group called our Diversity and Equity Committee. Um, this committee is a really powerful committee um, that we, I think, has served our agency really well. It is committed to the justice, equity, diversity, and inclusivity work as driving principles um, for all of us. And so our committee researches and hosts trainings for all of our staff across all of our departments. Um, the committee has also provided recommendations to the secretary about the needs of our agency. And this year, the 
committee um, has added um, some additional uh, staff members. It is a cross department um, committee, but those folks have, um, they're also stepping back to take a look at, okay, with Carla on board now, who is helping us prioritize some of our environmental justice um, and civil rights work, how does that align with our um, diversity and equity committee and what kinds of, um, what kinds of work do we want to do? And so it's, um, it's fluid and it's collaborative with one another. So um, I know that we, um, I'm coming up on some time here. So I'm just going to provide one final reflection, which is, um, which is uh, something that um, I've heard a couple of different participants in this work who have been spending the past couple of years um, working within diversity, equity, inclusion. And I and I when I listen to it, I try to um, remind myself of this regularly when I'm trying to establish pathways for us to make progress as a focused effort at ANR. And that's that this work around diversity, equity, and inclusion, it must be consistent, it must be repetitive. Um, it deserves the space and time for participation that's intentional. So that's where this concept of meaningful exchange comes in. And the Just Transitions Committee talks to that as well. And then lastly, really building into the process and exposure of training and a training atmosphere for all of our colleagues from folks who are doing field work to folks who are working on grants to folks who are in enforcement. It's a it's a across the scope of the board. So we have a lot of moving pieces and it's it's while we have well we have lots of um, years of understanding of this work, I would say we're in a space where we are finally able to recognize what kinds of resources we need to move some pieces of this puzzle forward for us and also to um, make some progress in reprioritizing a lot of our energy in the same direction. So it's been an exciting year. I'm really looking forward to the next year. And I think that all of the work that you're doing at the Climate Action Council is, is very much benefiting the work that agencies are trying to do individually as well. So I will pause there and I really appreciate the um, time to speak to all of you and, and happy to answer any questions and also available after this, if anybody ever wants to chat. <laughs> Excellent. Thanks, Maggie, so much. Okay, a great overview of what's going on. Any reactions or, or questions for Maggie? Uh, <clears throat> we've got a few minutes to just uh, talk with her about priorities inside ANR in this space. Any reactions or, or thoughts folks have? It sounds like you were very clear, Maggie. Excellent. Okay. Well, thanks, Maggie, for being with us. Um, and um, <clears throat> and absolutely, I encourage everyone to take up Maggie's offer to just reach out to her if you have questions about what ANR is trying to do in this space. Okay. Great. Um, all right. So with that reflection, let's go into the meat of our conversation today, which is the public engagement overview. As I mentioned, there's sort of three pieces to this that we're gonna work on over the next hour and a half or so. And let me see if they cut and paste nicely into the chat. Just give me one second here. They do, okay. So I just dropped the three pieces <clears throat> um, into the chat of what we're trying to work on. And to do this, we've got the folks, the consultants who've been leading this public engagement effort here. And their presentation actually has been posted since yesterday on the site as well. Um, but Kara Pike from Climate Action and, and Sarika Tandon from uh, Rise Consulting uh, are here, as is Meredith, I think. Meredith Hur is here as well. Yep. Meredith is here as well. And those three individuals have been doing all of this hard work. Um, and making it happen and are here to um, give us an overview of what's being heard. So the way we thought we'd do this is there's these three bullets um, and we definitely wanna pause after the second and we may even pause after the first um, of getting an overview of what actually happened, what were the different channels for engagement that happened and sort of the amount of participation that occurred 
um, in those channels. And then there's the real chunk here, which is, so what are we hearing? What are, what are Vermonters saying? Uh, and that we're gonna listen to. We're gonna pause for sure after that. And then we're gonna think about, so what next, right? What are some of the gaps uh, that we would wanna think about? How might we address those going forward? With that, let me turn it over. I believe Kara, you're gonna uh, take it away from the top. Um, so let me turn it over to you. And if for whatever reason your screen share is not working well, I also have your slides here. So just let me know. Okay, great. Thank you, David. And thanks everyone for the opportunity to present uh, what we heard from Vermonters about the Climate Action Plan. Um, as uh, David mentioned, there were a number of different channels. So I'm gonna first walk through those then um, give a sense of, uh, at a high level, some of the themes, and then turn it over to Meredith and Sarika to walk through the detailed findings. Uh, we had a lot of good input, uh, insightful thoughts on how climate change is impacting Vermont, people's communities and lives, as well as what people would like to see prioritized in the Climate Action Plan. So the different channels at the very outset when we were developing the engagement plan, we spoke with 37 stakeholders and we didn't just ask them about engagement strategies, we asked them about their concerns regarding climate change and the solutions they'd like to see prioritized. So that was one channel. Uh, we had public engagement events and I'll go through those in a little bit more detail. Uh, a mix of online and in-person, reaching a total of 521 attendees. We had 679 responses to the public opinion survey that was online, and there were 365 comments submitted through um, the public comment form on the website. So overall, we heard from 1,602 Vermonters in this process. So I'm gonna walk through a couple of the pieces from those initial uh, interviews, both one-on-one -on -one phone interviews, as well as the roundtables we held with stakeholders. We heard a number of themes that uh, really continued throughout the process. Um, there was a lot of concern expressed about the impact of climate change on low-income communities in particular, and concerns regarding access to solutions as well as impacts on natural and working lands. When we asked about solutions during this initial round, we heard individuals express interest in an equitable approach to planning, a just energy transition and land management solutions. So moving ahead then, uh, in terms of the events that we held, um, there were a number of in-person uh, in September and you can see the, the, the breakdown if you go to the next slide of who attended, how many people were at those different events as well as uh, the online. So there was a lot of data to go through and thanks to Meredith for sifting through uh, all of that. But in terms of the events, there were definitely some key themes that we heard when we asked people's concerns about climate impacts. Uh, health was a major, theme including mental health. Uh, There's a lot of discussion about uh, climate refugees and migration into the state, um, uh, impacts on food, water quality, drought, air quality, invasive species, storms and housing. So you could see all of those, but I wanted to just uh, call out a few examples. So looking across all of, we're gonna uh, go through the different findings from the events and the, the survey, but I just wanted to highlight a few things that really uh, rose to the top through, throughout. Um, Vermonters really do want bold action on climate change. There was a lot of passion uh, about the plan and hope that it will actually achieve uh, what it's aiming to. Equity was a core concern. We heard it through all of those channels, um, how uh, climate change will impact people differently as well as uh, the solutions. And um, quite a lot of, of comments there around affordability um, and access to climate solutions. So uh, wanting those, but uh, how do we actually access them and, and come up with the finances to make that happen? One thing that we thought was really interesting that we wanted to highlight was 
uh, how often we heard deep concern about the impact of climate change on young people and on mental health. Uh, people worried about um, just the, the sort of apocalyptic view into the future and how do we really uh, ensure in particular young people are, are engaged. Um, and then one thing that was uh, quite interesting uh, and it happened in the online events as well as um, in the in-person, we had people in small groups discussing things and uh, people really came away with a sense of being connected to others who care about the issue and pretty passionate about the plan. So I think it was impactful in terms of really getting a good foundation of folks who are really uh, wanting to be supportive and see this process moving forward. So with that, I'll uh, turn it over to Meredith. Thanks, Kara. Um, so I'll walk through um, the different action areas. So in the different events, we asked folks to consider each of the different um, big bucket, big buckets or action areas that we had um, put together um, based on the great work of the, the subcommittees. Um, so I'll walk through the most frequently mentioned priorities for each of the um, action areas, and you'll have more detail. I'll focus just on the, on the top priorities for each of these, and you'll see more detail in the slides, and also um, there'll be more detail in the summary report that we're putting together too. Um, so for efficient transportation systems and vehicles, uh, we saw that the most frequently mentioned priorities were definitely around joining TCI and also increasing focus on equity in TCI, um, encouraging EV adoption, especially rebates uh, for low-income individuals to make EVs more affordable, um, uh, secondary market incentives, and fast charge stations were all big priorities around uh, EVs that emerged. Um, also reducing vehicle miles driven, so encouraging carpooling and ride sharing, um, having digital ride boards, and, and safe bike lanes um, were all popular ideas too. So in terms of the barriers, we asked folks not only just about priorities, but also about what they saw as barriers and then also what they saw that was missing um, in the plan. And so in terms of barriers for uh, transportation systems, the ones that were most frequently identified were cost access and range issues with EVs, um, and also lack of public transportation in rural areas. And then for uh, the participants also identified priorities that they saw as missing for transportation were uh, efficient, convenient public transit, ultralight electric rail, speed management um, came up often, and also uh, alternative fuels like biodiesel. So our next action area were uh, better buildings and homes. And so the most frequently mentioned priorities um, in this area were weatherization. This came up um, quite frequently and we'll see it later on when I walk through the survey findings too. Um, so weatherization and efficiency uh, initiatives uh, to prioritize affordability for renters and low income properties, um, focus on the oldest housing stock first and to increase workforce to provide that weatherization. There's also interest in efficient, uh, efficiency requirements for new construction, uh, updated building codes for all construction that establishes minimum standard uh, efficiency systems, code enforcement and green retrofitting. And there was also interest in educational resources for contractors and, and additional workforce training. So in terms of barriers, we saw that um, there was a focus on the lack of affordability, a lack of affordable climate resilient housing, um, concerns about the cost burden of weatherization. So uh, a lot of interest in weatherization, but also concerns about the affordability of, of those measures. Um, and as well as renter access to weatherization opportunities, that, in, that issue of, um, of how renters will have access to these improvements was, um, was commonly mentioned. And then along the, among the elements participants saw as missing were affordable carbon neutral housing um, built by uh, workers who are union protector, protected and with, with fair paying jobs, uh, affordable safe housing for farm workers and affordable denser housing development. So for clean, reliable energy, um, we saw that the, the most frequently mentioned priorities were around making renewable energy affordable uh, and providing that access to low income Vermonters, 
making in-state renewable energy, energy electricity generation um, and increasing the RES requirements and then seeing 100% RES as a high priority. A local clean energy generation and expanding small scale community owned solar, a distributed solar, rooftop solar, and also solar mandates on new construction and parking lots. And again, there's more, more detail and priorities there and they'll be in the report as well. Um, but for the main barriers that came up were um, energy transition costs, and also concern around the sources that we think of as clean energy still having environmental and environmental justice impacts. And this came up most frequently around industrial wind concerns. And in terms of what's missing, uh, participants identified um, uh, exponents that included education for Vermonters to be able to make informed energy choices, uh, asking people to take personal responsibility for reducing energy use, a just transition policies for those who may be facing job loss uh, with an energy transition, and also ensuring accurate emissions accounting. I'm going to turn it over to Sarika to walk through our next action area. Thanks, Meredith. So for resilient working and natural lands, some of the frequently mentioned priorities were support for workforce development and training within the forest economy and other natural environment sectors. And it's really interesting how so many of these um, could be cross-listed into other sections. Uh, and this one really stood out to me. Um, helping farmers meet goals, protect, preserve, and maintain their ability to farm, subsidize regenerative agriculture and carbon sequestration. Um, something that, another idea that was really popular across many of the meetings was the creation of local food hubs and incentives for local food systems, gardening, CSAs, farmer's market, as well as agricultural processing, storage, and distribution. Um, so the next slide for um, barriers, there was uh, just the affordability of land, which ties into some of the questions around climate migration and COVID migration. Um, the idea of who is receiving money to preserve working in natural lands and how, for example, land trusts are not accessible to BIPOC people to own land um, and conservation policies that conflict with housing and access needs. Participants also identified missing components, including allocations to BIPOC communities to ensure that everyone is directly and equitably benefiting from investments and incentives. Under strong rural communities, a frequently mentioned priorities included broadband access and remote work opportunities uh, to reduce our emissions through commuting, regional backbone infrastructure, and more support for small business development, including training, mentoring, and healthcare. Barriers identified included a lack of funding or expertise social justice tensions and impacts, and climate migration. Participants identified missing components, including community building opportunities, involvement of rural communities in decision-making and programs for people experiencing homelessness. Yeah, Chris, that's such a good question about regional backbone infrastructure. What does that mean? Um, I think that was pulled directly from, from notes from a participant, so I can, try to interpret it, um, but I, I can't say that I'll capture the intent of the of the participant. I think it um, I think regional backbone infrastructure means just having a regional base for things like broadband or other kinds of infrastructure that strong rural communities need. Does anyone else have an interpretation that's different, Meredith? No, that's my understanding as well. So um, moving on to the low carbon products and processes. So this again was the um, category that participants seemed to spend the least amount of time on. It was the last on the list and it um, people didn't engage as much with it. So we have one slide for this. So the most frequently mentioned priorities here were carbon removal technology um, and using it at the large plant level, corporate responsibility. So really looking at who the major polluters are and having them tend to their impacts and strong extended producer responsibility laws. 
Biomass was noted as a key barrier and gaps identified included personal energy use, programs to offset food miles, and incentives to shift asphalt and concrete stands. So question from Chris, is that plant or physical plant? I think it's physical plant um, as far as like um, industrial infrastructure plant. Thanks for clarifying that, Chris. So I'd like to share some um, some reflections also from the BIPOC public input session, um, sort of as a separate category. Now, the first thing I want to do is just take a moment to explain the rationale for the BIPOC sessions. And I, I share this because the session was contested by members of the public. Um, we ended up having to reschedule it because there was um, there was a disruptive level of, of um, backlash against even the idea of it. So I want to just firmly establish why we, we had a specific BIPOC input session. So nationally um, inter and internationally, we know that BIPOC communities experience differential vulnerabilities to climate change. And in Vermont, we have documented disparities around environmental justice, health outcomes, and other areas. And I've just put a picture from the Act 54 report uh, from the Attorney General and the Human Rights Commission, just in case anyone um, hasn't read this, it just documents how systemic racism impacts six of the major systems in the state, um, which can sort of show you how, how that could show up in, in during a climate disturbance or climate impacts. So I also wanna name that BIPOC communities, so that's a group consisting of many groups in Vermont. And so each of these individual groups experiences differential vulnerabilities. And then outside of BIPOC communities, there's also many other communities that experience differential vulnerabilities. Um, and so I wanna share a little bit about what we heard at this session. And the next slide, please. So some of the key takeaways is that the main climate impacts that we're facing sort of signal systemic issues at the state level that have not been addressed and will be exacerbated by the climate crisis and felt disproportionately by BIPOC communities. So some target areas here are affordable and climate resilient housing and land, affordable healthcare and clean energy. Uh, the participants felt that there was a lack of representation and inclusion of BIPOC voices in the subcommittees and the climate council. And they felt that the rush timeline undermined the ability for BIPOC people to meaningfully engage. They um, shared that priorities identified in the climate plan uphold a corporate profit model that will not financially benefit BIPOC communities. And that due to the lack of representation and outreach, many on the call voiced concerns over the legitimacy from an equity point of view of the climate action plan process and a lack of trust that the plan would be successfully implemented because of the intensity of the timeline. Next slide, please. So some gaps that were identified across all of the five sector areas were um, BIPOC involvement and agency in decision-making, BIPOC representation and opportunities to lead in the process, the, and the prioritization of equity and shifting of power dynamics that are required for equity to happen. Some of the recommendations that came out of this meeting were to create an independent body, including BIPOC community members, to report on actual performance and effectiveness of the plan, more BIPOC control of funding and resources, and more representation on the council uh, of Abenaki and BIPOC Earth stewards to participate in the decision-making. There was also a call to focus on thinking outside the box with regards to climate adaptation and green jobs. So I'm gonna pass things back to Kara now um, to talk about some gaps. Oh no, is that what we're doing next? Or Meredith, are you gonna go over the surveys first? Yeah, I can walk through the survey quickly first. I think that'll be good. Thanks. Because we had a good response to that. Oh, there we go. Um, so we actually, we, uh, we fielded the survey uh, last month. Um, so it hasn't, um, I've been impressed with our numbers. Um, we've had 679 responses um, to the survey uh, since September. And I'll just quickly go through that uh, numbers. And you have these in the, in the deck too, and also we'll include them in the report. But a large majority of respondents, 71% said they've been personally affected by climate change, um, which I thought was a really important number. Um, 
And when asked to describe how they've been affected, um, common responses were around flooding, storms, heat waves, seasonal changes, droughts, and then also ticks and pests. Um, we see the majority of respondents were interested in a range of climate related issues, principally uh, changes to forests and wetlands and ecosystems uh, and severe rain and flooding um, that was followed by heat waves and again, climate exacerbated illnesses and changes to working lands. So a lot of what we are seeing in the survey um, tracked nicely with what we are seeing the, in the event too, in terms of uh, people's concerns. Um, it was interesting, we asked this question and we had folks uh, respond based on what they were concerned about um, across the state, across the community, and then themselves personally. And we saw a lot of those similar themes, but then we also saw some interesting distinctions too that emerged that um, at the state level, respondents you know, said they were interested or concerned about tourism, about the maple industry, um, water and air quality and extreme weather uh, emerged at a community level, as a community level concern. And then concern for children and future generations was really top of mind when people think about direct impacts to themselves personally. So kind of seeing those different layers of how people are thinking about this issue and how it affects them. Um, in terms of energy use, uh, majority of respondents want to reduce fossil fuel use, reduce emissions, uh, and increase affordability and equitable programs. We also have saw that respondents identified a number of ways that their community needs support um, to reduce emissions and prepare for impacts. And that included incentives and subsidies for EVs and charging stations. So again, tracking, tracking uh, similarly with what we heard in the event. Uh, improved public transportation, uh, transportation alternatives, and energy audits and financial support for, for weatherization and housing upgrades. So a lot of those similar themes um, emerging. Um, we asked, uh, when asked about what they would like to see prioritized, again, weatherization, energy efficiency subsidies, and access to public transportation were those top priorities. Um, Again, weatherization right at the top, um, along with clean energy uh, for buildings and land conservation. So really seeing a lot of those commonalities emerging of those top priorities. Um, and then real quickly, we also have the, the public comment form has been open um, and there was an analysis done uh, by ANR for those comments from uh, June to October. Um, and in reviewing that analysis, we saw that clean, reliable energy was overwhelmingly um, the most common primary theme um, across those comments uh, with clean energy concerns, really tracking what we heard from the events and through the survey. Um, and then uh, the analysis also included secondary theme. And here we see that equitable just transition um, emerged as the most common secondary theme across those comments. And those comments uh, included concerns about uh, accurate emissions accounting and also impacts of, um, of hydro-Quebec on Indigenous communities. I'm going to switch it over to Kara. Great. And so Kara, just quickly, before we walk into the gaps and the next steps, I wonder if we want to do a pause just on findings. Sure. Does that sound good? Yeah. Okay. Great. So, um, <clears throat> so I think actually maybe we'll drop the slides just for a second. We can pull them back up as needed. Um, and I just want to sort of engage everybody here from the council <clears throat> on the findings. And we'll talk, we know where we're going to go. We're going to talk about what's next and some of the gaps and things like that. But just on what's being heard, First, if anybody has clarifying questions, there were a few things in the chat. I think uh, some were answered, some have not been answered um, about uh, <clears throat> on, some, on the survey was, were those open-ended uh, questions or were they uh, uh, choose from a list kind of questions? Uh, and can we get some raw data? So there's some basic questions like that. Maybe uh, Meredith or Kara, Sarika, you wanna answer those right now and then we'll see some other clarifying questions. And then I want to talk about some of the themes. Yeah, when uh, for the survey, when you saw the chart, those were the multiple choice questions. And when I had the answers listed um, more in list or bolded forms, those were pulled as a qualitative analysis from the open ended questions. Um, in terms of the raw data, we're putting together a summary report and um, I'd have to go through just for 
confidentiality issues, I guess, but I don't see a problem with including the full um, survey responses as an appendix to that report, but that's something we haven't discussed. So I'll have to see um, if that's available. Great, okay. Do folks have other clarifying questions for the team here about what happened or a particular bullet point or idea that was presented? Any sort of questions people have about that for the team? David? Yeah, Anson. For, this, please, yeah, please. just maybe, is, is there any more, any more details about the speed of developing and delivering this plan. Uh, um, did you get any more in-depth comments? I know this was a bullet point that um, not enough time given to develop the plan. Do you have any more any more details or any nuggets about that? That uh, specifically came from the BIPOC roundtable. When we get into gaps, we were just going to uh, discuss how the compressed timeline did affect the process and the limitations that it presented. Thanks, okay. Um, and <clears throat> the comment in the chat from Sue about this, or Secretary Flynn, Joe, did you wanna go ahead? Uh, I, I can wait for Sue, thank you. I'm just, I'm looking at Sue's point in the chat about what happened with the BIPOC event. This is something that we discussed at the steering committee last week as well. But I think um, maybe Sarika or Jane or somebody could do a quick uh, overview of, of what happened and how that got rescheduled. Would you like me to, or happy to defer to you, Sarika? Go ahead, Jane. Yeah, thank you. Um, um, as the evening was approaching um, the Tuesday night that we planned to hold the event, um, it became clear through phone calls to agency, through phone calls directly to um, our consultants and others that there were people who were um, were challenging um, the legitimate legitimacy of moving forward with such an event. And it became clear that we didn't have enough um, uh, safety precautions in place to um, have and invite people into the conversation. And so um, at the um, rate running up against the hour of holding it at six o'clock, we made the difficult decision to pause and um, revisit um, how we handled the event um, so that we could ensure safety um, precautions were in place um, for folks who may not have had the best intentions um, to join in on the meeting. Um, we recognize that this was likely also because we had a bump in registration dramatically right before the event was to happen, as well as folks um, in addition to calling and emailing too, and um, people not honoring the intent of that. So we um, delayed it the week um, and were able to put um, pre-registration screening questions in place, as well as to have people monitoring the Zoom call to make the difficult decision if needed to um, kick people off the meeting. Right, for behavior, yeah. So that's Luckily what happened. Enough, that didn't happen. So. And it didn't happen, right. Okay, great. But it did deter the number of participants, I'll just say, which wasn't, I'm sure we'll hear about as Kara moves forward with um, the next parts of the presentation. Yeah, okay. Great, um, Secretary Flynn. Uh, thank you very much. I'm curious, was there a way to filter, um, review, um, heat map, the types of responses we got from where people either attended the forum or where they lived. I know when I attended uh, one of the public meetings, they asked where we lived. And I'm not trying to associate a person, specific person with their place, but an example of why I'm asking the question, was it people in rural Vermont who expressed an interest in more transportation in rural Vermont? Or was that from a meeting in Burlington or a meeting in, my, you know, that, that's the, the sense of my question. Yeah, because I, I just think that, I don't know how to do that, but I think it would be interesting. Uh, for example, you had one in Island Pond and it would be interesting to understand or perhaps see the results that you specifically got from Island Pond versus elsewhere, just to understand how people across Vermont in different places see 
uh, what the strengths, weaknesses, barriers, or gaps might be. Because I think that's important to us as counselors as we look to what the ultimate plan is. Thank you. Yeah, we didn't in our analysis so far distinguish it per location. Um, I think the, the themes were incredibly consistent though across the events, including in Island Pond. And, um, you know, I think that was affected in part because you, we actually had a very high turnout of youth to that meeting. And so there was a real intergenerational dialogue about what needs to happen. And um, yeah, so, but I'll just turn it over to Sarika and Meredith to add anything else on that. Yeah, right now the summary we've aggregated across um, all of the different public input channels. Um, we do in, in terms of raw notes from each of those events, we do have them separated by by event. And then for the survey, we did ask for zip code. Um, so each of the uh, survey responses is also tagged with a, with a zip code for that respondent um, resident. So that, that data is currently in there, um, but for the moment we have aggregated the, um, the findings. Okay. Yeah, and I'll also add that um, we only had one in-person session and anything that would be close to considered a city and that was Colchester. Uh, so in the in-person meetings, three out of four were in very rural areas and there was, my sort of anecdotal summation would be that uh, the, the ask for public transport was also from rural communities. Um, it wasn't just coming from people in more, more of the highly populated centers. Yeah, and, and thanks. That was just an example of the point yeah. I was making. I wasn't zeroing yeah. specifically on sure. that. Yeah. But we did survey uh, in the online meetings, we did survey by region of the state, and we had, I think, representation from all regions at all meetings. Is that correct? Okay. okay. Thank you. What I'd like to do now <clears throat> is just engage all of your brains for a second. And Cameron's going to drop a link in the chat, and I'm going to ask just counselors to click on it or to fill it out. It's a quick opportunity for write a phrase <clears throat> or a short sentence about what's really jumping out at you from these findings. So if you're not a counselor, if you're just observing our meeting, please don't fill this out. I'm just, just an honor system here, folks. Um, but for the counselors, <clears throat> members of the Climate Council, if you could click on that Menti link that's in the chat, and what it's going to ask you to do is think of what's really jumping out at you here. What really is important um, that you're hearing in these findings, right? And so I'll ask everyone just to use, take a moment of reflection and think about that, right? If you're having a hard time clicking on the link, again, honor system folks here, if you're a climate council member, please use this. If you're just observing us today, please don't. Um, write something. Let's just be quiet for a second, I'll let you think. And when Cameron has starting to get some results, he'll share his screen with the results and we can see what each other are writing. If anybody's, if any climate counselors are having a hard time clicking on the link, just let me know. And Gina asks if subcommittee members can participate. it. Sure. Subcommittee members, yes. Thanks, Gina, for asking. Um, <clears throat> so Cam, when you start to see some answers, if you could share your screen with what you're seeing, that would be great. So while you all are thinking and writing, I'm taking a look at what's being shared in the screen here.
Okay, so you're probably seeing the same thing that I'm seeing, right? If you're reading this <clears throat> as it's scrolling a little bit, right? Concerns about the velocity of the work, right? And what that means. Uh, recognizing there's a lot of interest in the public in us, in the Climate Council had doing meaningful work on this issue, building trust with BIPOC communities and others. <clears throat> there's some specific mentions here around issues, climate migration, support for TCI, et cetera. Okay, great. All right, we will share these back with you um, <clears throat> in the meeting summary, just so you have it. Again, this is kind of honor system, so take it with a grain of salt, assuming it, it honor system was <laughs> respected on that. Um, so thanks, Cameron, for sharing that. That was to engage your brains as much. Let's have a conversation about it for a second. And I want to park just for a second the, the issues about being rushed, because that's going to really come into our next steps conversation in just a moment. Um, so let's not go to those set of comments just now. But other things people want to say to each other right now, you as a council, um, about what's, what's out there and what these meetings lifted up. Are there other comments people want to make, particularly when you saw all that? what you just wrote right now. Anything that people need to say out loud? Awfully quiet today, folks. Interesting. Bram? Uh, you know, one thing that really just struck me um, is that the people who attended public engagement events are self-selected and non-representative. Um, you know, that group's clearly very concerned about climate change and very engaged and wants things done and wants, th wants things done equitably. And uh, I, you know, I'm interested in um, how that differs from what uh, kind of a actual full representation of the Vermont community would show us. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Bram. Yeah. Chris? Yeah, I'm thinking, I mean, we've, I think we've all owned and acknowledged that this uh, timeline is crunched. I think the legislators who I've spoken were engaged with mainly through testimony have come to recognize that too. I'm just thinking based on the feedback that we've heard, um, in addition to the preparation of this plan, we just need to be mindful of all of this as we proceed past December 1st. Um, so we need to think about how we're going to continue to do our work uh, going forward. And I'll also just offer, I really think, um, you know, I hope folk will, will ask the legislature to uh, give adaptation resilience the same standing as greenhouse gas reduction in any future iteration of the act. Yeah. Thanks, Chris. Any other reflections we have about these findings? And I do want to pick up on that point about what happens after December 1st in just a second. Um, but any other reflections about what we're hearing in these findings? All right, so Kara, yes, let's uh, let's jump into that next piece about gaps and next steps and what uh, what we might think about in terms of further engagement. Okay, great. Well, um, back to the timeline issue. Um, you know, having to have this input at this point uh, really did rush things considerably. And um, as you heard from Sarika, definitely impacted our ability to reach different Vermonters, including BIPOC community members, um, those experiencing poverty, uh, disabilities, those with disabilities, and other Vermonters uh, that are experiencing differential impacts. Uh, we had tremendous interest from the 37 stakeholders we engaged at the outset to help host events, amplify, you know, share the survey, whatnot. And we just did not really have enough time to 
uh, return to that. We did share the survey with them. We shared the uh, event invite and a communications pack, um, but we had hoped for a much deeper engagement there as well. Uh, in terms of the events um, themselves, we made the decision to go ahead with the in-person events, even with uh, COVID concerns, but held them outside as a result. And um, I think there were issues around accessibility with that. Um, you wouldn't have been able to get to many of the couple of the sites if you were in a wheelchair, for example, or had a walker. Um, it was dark uh, and in some cases it got a little chilly as well. Um, but despite that, I do wanna just reiterate that um, there was a lot of, of, of passion uh, in the conversations. And you know, I've been working on climate communications for 14 years and I really feel there's a new level of alarm now um, that we weren't seeing before. Um, and even if we did, get folks who self-selected into the process, the tenor of the conversations, the degree of concern, the degree to which people are experiencing the impacts, um, I think is really notable. And um, yeah, just the desire for uh, Vermont to lead on this, like seeing people seeing this as an opportunity uh, and wanting to see uh, bold action, despite uh, some skepticism around whether or not that may happen. So I'm going to um, go through um, what we have planned for the next steps. And I know that we have some questions, I think, David or Jane, you'll pose uh, regarding clarity that we're hoping to gain from the council uh, on this next phase. So once um, we'll, we'll, as Meredith said, we will be summarizing this, putting it together in a report that will be shared and then we'll move into preparing for once there is the initial plan. Um, and part of that will be setting up the online engagement platform where we can share the plan and have people uh, move through it and, and weigh in on it. Uh, we also do have three events uh, in the schedule, which we were uh, are planning to do online, um, both with COVID and just the, the timing of that. Uh, so there, there are a few more pieces there. Um, and uh, with that, though, I'll turn it over back to you, David and Jane, in order to tee up the, the conversation we want to have. Yeah. Okay. Thanks, Kara. So as the public comment suggested, and as you all suggested, uh, there's this sense that the velocity of our work um, isn't getting in the way of, but certainly is impacting how people are perceiving their interactions with uh, sort of public interaction with this plan. And it raises the question, if we're developing an initial draft, excuse me, an initial climate action plan on December 1st, um, what is, what kind of interaction are we doing in public engagement are we doing after that? And to what end, right? If we've already done the initial plan. And this is something that we've been uh, talking about a little bit with Climate Access and Rise um, <clears throat> and Jane and others. Uh, but there's this sort of thinking of the work, as you all have said, to some degree begins on December 1st and uh, imagining the implementation of the ideas that we're putting on the table. And that implementation is gonna need lots of input from lots of Vermonters uh, and, and different types of folks. And so what we could do as a climate council, what you all could do as a climate council is uh, encourage this next wave of engagement that can happen in January and February, and then deliver the results of that engagement to the different entities that will be taking these ideas up in, into an implement, implementation space, which would be the legislature, the administration and others. And so a significant amount of engagement could happen over the winter. Um, and that engagement can be summarized by you all as a council. And you can deliver that not only to yourselves as you're working through your next steps, but also to the folks who would be implementing your ideas, which would be you know, primarily legislature and, and administration, but could be others as well. So we're trying to wrestle with those ideas of 
how is engagement meaningful after December 1, knowing that there's appetite and interest in engagement and some frustration in the velocity of all this. So that's what we wanted to put out there. And Jane, I don't know if there's a, a finer point you'd like to put on in terms of how to frame up what we're suggesting here. No, I, I think you have it. So I'm happy to feed into the conversation as it evolves with more detail. Great. Great. Okay. So Secretary Flynn, do you want to um, comment a little bit more on, on what you have in the chat there? Well, there's always a time lag between what somebody's saying and what I'm thinking by the time I type it in. So bear that in mind. I, I, what I was referring to was uh, at least about the car before the horse, you know, we're putting something together by December 1st, but we're, I think, I don't want to speak for people, but I think we're all sort of acknowledging that there's way more input that has to happen. And it's logical to assume that that input would be valuable in knowing what more Vermonters want and valuable to what an end product would be. So that's the reference to the cart before the horse thing. I, I mean, we're, I know the reality is we're all compressed by this date, but I think it's fair to say we all know it's unrealistic. And, and, and again, I just made the point that if my math is correct, the 1,602 people represent like one quarter of 1% of Vermonters. And I know that, I don't know what the, the expected trend number should be, uh, and certainly taking nothing away from the effort to gather input from the 1,602 people we've gotten input from, but there's an awful lot of people that, you know, haven't had the opportunity uh, or that perhaps are unaware and I just think that somehow we have to grapple with that. Thanks. Thank Indeed. you. Yeah. Secretary Moore. Hang on one second. You're on uh, mute still. There we go. Can you hear me? I had mm -hmm. some, okay. I had had some speaker issues earlier too. Uh, just following up and building on what Joe said, I wondered um, if Kara and the team has any uh, reflections they could offer about how participation in Vermont uh, compares to maybe participation they've seen in other states uh, where they have they have sort of supported similar processes um, and, and including comments on on timeline and and sort of reactions just to the the, the sense that the process feels rushed. Um, I imagine that that you know appreciating this schedule is particularly aggressive. Um, that this may be a, a common theme that comes up because it is it's such a, a large and uh, challenging um, undertaking. Thinking about comprehensive climate action, and would just appreciate any perspective they might be able to share. Uh, sure. Well, I think. Um just one thing to, to keep in mind in terms of like a public opinion survey it, for something to be considered like a national survey valid of public opinion, you're looking at 2,500 people, right? So when you look at, we had almost 700 folks uh, responding just to that survey, that's actually pretty decent. Um, and in terms of other communities, um, you know, I think it is comparable. So for example, we worked on the adaptation plan for Louisville Metro government in, um, and we had just under 3000 people participate in the process through a whole range of ways, but that is a community, a metro area with like more than 5 million people, right? So it's, so I think actually our, our numbers are decent. I am concerned about just the gaps that we mentioned, um, the lack of BIPOC engagement per what we were aiming for, and also um, those with you know income discrepancies, those items that we mentioned. Um, but I think overall our, our numbers are are good. I guess I was initially thinking that once the the plan comes out in December, there would be a, a public comment period. Like that's typically what uh, we see happen with plans so that you do have that other opportunity that's really clear how the input is going to be um, used. And I know with the comprehensive energy plan, 
that's their process as well, where they have the uh, they have to do the five public hearings and then, you know, change their plan according to what they heard and note what changed from the draft to the final per that public input. So, you know, I think that's why we we're just hoping for the clarity around how this next phase of input should be used, because I think what we want to avoid is um, not listening to the input. Like, you know, we're going to go out again, work really hard to get more people to weigh in. So how is that going to actually influence what would happen with uh, the implementation of the plan? Thanks, Kara. Sue? Hi, can you hear me? Yep. Okay, great. Um, I guess I, uh, I'm not certain, I, to some degree, Secretary Flynn, I agree, there's a bit of the cart before for the horse, but I do really want us to acknowledge that a ton has been done. This has been, yes, rushed, but pretty intensive engagement. And, um, you know, the, and, and I don't want us to, to delegitimize the, what's been done. Um, and, uh, and to suggest that it will always feel rushed. Uh, no one will all, ever have enough time and access uh, because this is a very, <laughs> you know, we're in a bubble. And I uh, appreciate that the point made earlier that the people we've heard from are the people in the bubble of concern. And 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 we do um, this process is going to have to expand beyond that bubble. And I don't personally think we should delay a December 1st deadline, but we may um, need to change our expectations of what's being delivered there. I think from what I'm experiencing, listening to the presentations from the incredibly hardworking <laughs> folks uh, working on the details that it, these pathways and strategies are still quite high level. And you know this process of trying to do the equity lens is, is new and difficult. Um, we aren't getting to the details of funding and, and, and I hope we're gonna give some ability to prioritize, but maybe what we have to prepare for is December is the best we can do. And it is a real plan and by the way, this, the legislature asked us to come up with a plan that looks at mitigation and adaptation resilience. And I don't think that kind of a plan has ever really been put forward before. Uh, and yes, we've looked at this equity component and gotten out. It, it is simply not gonna be a complete final wrapped up plan. Uh, that's what I think when I'm sort of trying to observe what's happening. Uh, and, and, but I don't think we should try to slow down I think we should get to a point of completion for our work of this phase and dig in even further. I'm very excited to talk about what do we do uh, in this, what is normally a, a public comment phase that we could do more with because we've engaged new people and we wanna keep bringing them in and to the table is my point of view. Um, but I don't think we should give up or feel like we failed we have to acknowledge that we've been set up for a very difficult process and we've made tremendous progress. Thanks. Thanks, Sue. And I'll just note as well that um, the, there have been other activities happening that aren't part of this summary of the public engagement. Um, all there were significant stakeholder meetings and activities that the subcommittees really organized and were sort of direct interaction with the subcommittees that aren't summarized as part of this. And all three uh, subcommittees, uh, when I say three, the rural resilience, ag and ecosystem, and the cross sector mitigation, all did that work as well. So I just want to make sure that people are aware of that if they weren't fully aware of all that other activity. Uh, Joey, go ahead, please. Well, I just, I'll be brief because a lot of what I was thinking, Sue articulated well, and you sort of synopsized some of it, David, just to say that I think this is, you know, this is a moment in time. We've done a lot of work. We've done a lot, a lot of work previous to this to, to say that in the work that I've been involved in, you know, the comprehensive energy plan updates twice before, you know, two climate action plans, a lot of the input that we're getting is tracks very well to the input that we've gotten over the course of a decade. And that, you know, for me, working closely with local leaders on the ground, I'm hearing a lot of the same themes. It's just crystallizing more 
critically around the equity component. And that's where I feel like, you know, I think we have done some good work and we have a lot more good work to do. And now we have frameworks in place to do it. And I've said it before, and I'm going to say it again. I think we're going to get to a point where we're going to push, you know, some and prioritize things. And then somebody else is going to take it to a more refined level. And there will be a public engagement process around that as well, so that we can figure out the details um, of the different sort of more exact policy and programmatic design. So I think, you know, where we, where our work ends, somebody else with, you know, other people around that table who are the impacted communities, the providers, the practitioners themselves, if we are not, we'll be taking it to a more for, more refined level. And then, um, yeah, I guess lastly, what I would just say is in the cold and dark, but it was beautiful at Elmar. Um, I sat around the table listening to, um, as a climate council member, to the folks that, you know, the, the two young professional moms who were there and they're like, they were like, essentially like, I don't know what you should prioritize. I just want you to do it. So I think that that was like the lion's share of the message for me is, is like people are really leaning in on us and to like the experts and the folks to um, really sort of figure it out. Cause I think there is tremendous concern and tremendous recognition of the opportunity to, for an equitable, equitable transition. So I think that's our work ahead of us and it's certainly not gonna be done by December 1st. Thanks, Joy. Jane? Thanks, everyone. And David, the first point I raised my hand about was um, the stakeholder engagement. So thanks for bringing that up. And it actually feeds well into my broader com uh, comment that I wanted to make that hopefully will spur some more conversation. But in our check-in this week and in thinking and wrestling with what um, genuine engagement would look like after we have an initial plan that's been adopted and how we garner that feedback so people feel like we can use it still. Um, we started to coalesce around the way the action plan um, is going to be framed, um, which speaks to um, the key implementors um, and the buckets of actions being sorted by the lead implementors and then having them sorted further by the timeline um, that we've proposed in the um, cap drafting process. So in the cap drafting process, it speaks to um, five um, different implementers in which people are organizing and prioritizing their actions around. And then it speaks to four different um, timeline periods of which people are bucketing their actions. And so I suggest and think we consider that as we move out and go back out with the public, that we can organize our input um, from people around these suites of actions um, in order to bring people in in a more detailed conversation with and um, around the specificity and actions that they know best. Um, and then we can consolidate our feedback for those practitioners who are looking to take those actions and further design them into the programs and policies on the ground. So it's been one idea that we've been thinking about how we could do this, recognizing that we don't have an official public comment period for the climate action plan written in statute, um, but recognize that this um, uh, important step is only one in what we continue to do for public engagement going forward because we're committed to it. Thanks, Jane. That's helpful. June, go ahead, please. Thank you, David. <laughs> no, I'm sorry, I had to join the meeting late today. I've been uh, reflecting on what I've been hearing here in these exchanges, and I, I just want to bring forward the point that uh, Joe made earlier, because I, I think we took an unfortunate turn there. I didn't hear him criticizing the work of the outreach people at all. And I know that I have articulated similar concerns that as, as good as the effort was, I honestly can't think myself what more could have been done to reach more people um, and a, a greater variety of people having done this work myself professionally for 20 years. Uh, I, I stand in great admiration of what our consultants have done, but the fact remains of what Joe said, which is that a very small representative uh, proportion of Vermonters have weighed in on this prioritization process. And I don't think our conversation has addressed this point about cart before the horse. And, and for you know communication hygiene on the council, I would just uh, ask that you know, 
just because Joe's speaking up on that point doesn't mean he's trying to slow things down. Doesn't mean he's taking issue with the quality of the work of the consultants. It means he's trying to surface a point that we need to engage. Thanks, June. And I wonder when you think about it, what does that mean for our work, June? What does that mean in terms of how we go from here till December 1 and then what happens from December 1 on? Yeah, the way I, I'm approaching this is um, it doesn't matter how much more time I want. It just doesn't matter. I've been given a mandate and it's something that we have to do to the best of our ability. It's an impossible task in my judgment. Julie's going to smile because I've, I've used this line with her before, but you know, just because the legislature writes a statute that assigns us an impossible task, it doesn't mean that we're going to get that impossible task done and do it well. It means we're going to do it to the best of our ability. And I think we're smart to be thinking about subsequent uh, engagement because from my perspective, it's very much needed. I don't think Vermonters understand the Mack truck that's coming at them when you start matching up resources to priorities that this plan's going to embody. I just don't think they understand how this is going to impact their lives and what it's going to cost. That makes me very leery of writing a plan that purports to tell them what to do. But that's what the legislature has assigned to us and that's what we're going to do. Thanks, June. Chris? And to, Jesus, uh, uh, to June's point, I'll follow just briefly on that and say, I agree that I don't think the public knows because um, because we are, what we are proposing are, are uh, I've said it before is a complete reorientation of our relationship to energy and land use and basically life and living. The uh, on the flip side of that, uh, and again, this is you know part of the reality that I deal with as a regional planning commission director because of our local liaison work. I don't think the public understands what's coming the Mack truck that's coming at them in terms of the rains we're going to get, the heat waves we're going to get, the droughts we're going to get, the fires we're going to get, the movement of people around the country and around the world we're going to get, the pandemics we're going to get, and everything else. And so we we can't, you know, so I'm wor I do worry that the costs and the, uh, you know, regulations and other things are going to suck up all the oxygen in the room. And again, we're not going to act and the generations to come are going to have to deal with the shit storm of the decisions that we're that we keep putting off decade after decade after decade. And if I seem passionate about this, I've been working on this since 1991, and I just and I just am fed up with the inaction on it, of what we're forcing generations to come uh, to live with because of just things we keep putting off. And um, I'll just also add that, you know, it's not the worst thing that we go to the public after a plan is released and, and have them respond to to what's been done, just re as long as we recognize how much work we've got to do. And the other thing I'm a little concerned about is I feel like we're kind of started patting ourselves on the back for a plan that we really, uh, I know that bits and pieces are being drafted, but as a council, we've actually made very few policy decisions yet. And so I don't know how this council is going to react to, you know, I know that subcommittees have presented and other things, but as you see, when, when, when bits and pieces get presented, we start having robust conversations, but we've not necessarily arrived at any agreement. And so we got a long way to go in a couple of weeks. So before we get too comfortable, um, there's a lot of discussion yet to come. Pardon my French, by the way. All good. Thanks, Chris. Uh, Bram? Uh, you know, I think the legislation requires this council to submit an updated plan every four years, uh, but it does not forbid us from submitting an updated plan in one year. And I think, uh, you know, we need to keep working until we have achieved uh, satisfaction that we've got an inclusive plan and heard from an adequate cross-section of Vermonters. Um, December 1st is a first draft uh, in, in some ways um, on not just the engagement uh, front either. I mean, there are a lot of things we'd like to have more time to work on in terms of um, analyzing the costs and prioritizing and all those things. I think um, you know, June made a very good point that we have a December 1st deadline in statute and we will do absolutely the best we can. And um, we will keep working after that to address all the things that we can't address before December 1st. Thanks, Bram. Thanks. Abby? 
Um, hi, I'm, I'm trying to think about how to say this, but I guess I'm really struggling because as I am a practitioner, I've been living with the realities of climate change for the entire time I've been back on my family's farm. This is nothing new for me to navigate the day-to-day -day concerns and stress and weight of what it means to have climate change bearing down upon us. And I've been navigating those realities while attempting to go through this process with all of you. And I also need to say at some point, and I guess this is as good as any time, that at some point too, we need to acknowledge the toll and the legislature needs to acknowledge the toll that this work has taken on BIPOC specifically, community members who have been engaged in these processes and those of us who are coming from impacted communities and the inaccessibility and inequity that has been inherent within the process due to the deadline and a number of other factors, not the least of which is a complete and utter lack of education around the tenets of what a just transition actually entails. And I am deeply appreciative for all of the hard work and time and effort that has been put into everything that is coming forward. But this has been awful for me as a human, as a person who is trying to, who is performing regenerative agriculture, who is contributing to a sustainable food system and all of those different things. And I think that these accessibility concerns, who we're reaching, tracking how we know where we're reaching people and how we're elevating them and acknowledging and capturing the power dynamics that are inherent even within this council is some of the very baseline work that needs to be done in order for us to take the worthy work that has been done already and move it forward into a future where all Vermonters are honored as we move forward. And without at some point assessing that in clearer, more deliberative and more equitable ways, I don't understand how we are going to face the level of work and change that is necessary to take on into the future. And I don't say any of that to take away from the good work that has been done, but I just felt like I needed to say that at some point. Thanks. Thanks, Abby. Yeah. Okay. All right. So what I'm hearing is this angst, right? There's real angst out there. Uh, at the same time, a recognition that we will produce something on December 1st. Um, and we need to continue this work after December 1st, both in terms of engaging in the work of the council and looking at refining, improving um, uh, these recommendations that'll come out on December 1st. Okay. Um, are there things people want to say about anything more about the specifics about what that could look like, particularly after December 1st? Jane laid out an idea of trying to structure that engagement, particularly around the implementers, um, <clears throat> the implementing bodies and also around the type of uh, recommendation. Is there anything else people wanna say about what that could look like and how that would happen after December 1st? Okay. All right. Catherine? I think after December 1st, structured in the way that you just laid out, does nothing to correct the continued concerns we have heard about the lack of engagement and agency from a just transitions perspective. Simply because structuring public engagement around the implementers simply reinforces the current system we have where the decision makers are not broadly representative of BIPOC and other voices. So while from a transactional perspective, I think it makes a ton of sense in terms of moving actions forward. Um, if we really wanna look at the 
just transitions approach and the full inclusivity and real decision-making power spread among people other than the usual suspects, then I don't think that that's going to work. So it can't be the only way in which we move forward in engagement. That's helpful, Catherine. I wonder if you wanna say even a word more about what would be helpful um, to address specifically those kinds of concerns, the sort of deeper, more profound concerns. I have been thinking about that a lot and I, I don't have an answer um, exactly for what that would look like, partially because it's hard for me to envision what the plan is going to look like <laughs> and what those next steps will be, but certainly looking at what comes out as priority actions and figuring out what other stakeholders need to be at the table to move those priorities forward, those ones that are identified in the short term, um, is, is one way of doing that. Um, I just, I don't have an answer. And I just think that we all struggle with this question. And that's probably, and there isn't an easy answer. And that's probably why we haven't taken any action that's been recognizable to address the concerns that we first heard about six months ago and the letter sent to the council. Um, I think we all struggle with it and I don't have an answer. I wish I did. Fair enough. Okay. All right. Um, great. So that's tough, right? That's tough and it's a tough challenge for all of us. Um, and I think we can take up Catherine's comments now as a, uh, a challenge to say we need to figure this out in creative and smart and um, equitable ways. Okay. All right. Um, Julie, Secretary Moore. Yeah, I just uh, want to reflect that that there's both kind of the there's the words on the page in the Global Warming Solutions Act and the practical reality they have for the government agencies charged with implementing them. And I think we we have, you know, there's talk of, of draft and continued engagement and refinement. And there are also explicit court enforceable deadlines contained in the Global Warming Solutions Act. And at some point, I think we have to have a, a reconciliation around those pieces. Um, and it can't be just a conversation about process, absent acknowledging the fact that there are some very real demands placed on the agency of natural resources. How I'm gonna have to figure out how to navigate those as the leader of that agency in light of the work of the council, what may be the work of the legislature and the deadlines established um, that could result in court action and an outcome that I don't think any of us want absent um, a clear path forward. And just, I, I think all of that needs to be part of this conversation and dialogue. Um, we've, we've constructed a process and at times the, the reflections um, are largely about the timeline, which I agree is aggressive and painful and coming at, very, at the very real expense of, of other work that all of us in, in all likelihood um, could be engaged in, I'm not sure. Uh, this to me, this is one of the most important things to be engaged in, um, but recognizing that it's one of many demands placed on each of our time. Um, but at the same time, there's sort of a chain of action that's set in motion by the Global Warming Solutions Act, and we can't ignore um, what what those steps are that can and likely will occur um, absent some changes to the law, regardless of kind of the the process and next steps we make specifically. Um, the timeline provided for rulemaking, and I think the timeline the legislature is going to need to feel is going to feel like they need to act under regarding legislative changes, means that there, there's only so many pieces of this that can be allowed to continue to develop and morph. That people that that each of those bodies is likely to grab chunks of what's in the climate action plan um, and begin implementation steps. And I'm not sure how will you reconcile that? And that may go back to the comment Chris made about sort of the, de the decision-making components um, and identifying some of these policy options or settling on some of these policy options that needs to take place over the next six or so weeks. 
um, and just wanted to, to flag that and make sure we don't lose sight of, of the full set of requirements of the Global Warming Solutions Act that go well beyond emissions reduction requirements, um, the delivery of that, that action plan, but in terms of, of the, the effort and the requirements for agencies to act in response. Yeah. Thanks, Julie. Okay. Okay. All right. So, um, speaking of the next six weeks and this council needing to make some tough and powerful decisions around policy as part of the development of your initial climate action plan. Um, and just to confirm, there's nothing else folks want to say about these issues around the public engagement. Is there anything else before I pivot to the next thing? Okay. Thanks. Um, we uh, have essentially weekly council meetings from now until December 1st to work through the content of this initial climate action plan. Uh, and there's a schedule <clears throat> and Jane's been sending around the sort of detailed schedule about which sections of the plan will be ready for review and which meetings, et cetera. And what <clears throat> several of you in the steering committee have spoken about um, is the possibility of doing uh, a meeting in person, particularly around some of the trickiest issues that we can anticipate are gonna be um, issues that really require us to think creatively and to listen to each other um, and to find common ground, or at least identify very clearly where we don't have that common ground. So the possibility of an in-person meeting to do that after all this time on Zoom seems very compelling. Uh, we're still in a pandemic, uh, so it's not a slam dunk to do this, but we wanted to lay out um, this possibility of an in-person meeting. And I'll say a few things, and Jane and steering committee members, please weigh in as well. Um, we started with what would be the most high value use of time for being in person if we decided to try to make that work. And we thought uh, our meeting, uh, once we've had the subcommittees really lay out all their recommendations and we've identified where there's potentially some real sticking points among the council, among you all, and that would be our November 16th meeting. Um, and we could use that time period of the no November 16th meeting to really lean into the trickiest issues, whether they be some issues related to uh, emissions reductions or uh, adaptation uh, or resilience. So uh, November 16th, uh, which is a Tuesday, it's a normal meeting. Uh, we could extend that meeting and make it four or five hours in the afternoon. Um, and we could do a hybrid meeting and we want to test right now. We have a little Zoom poll we're going to ask you right now uh, uh, about your appetite to do that. Um, and knowing that it has to be in a location that is big, right? Has uh, ample space uh, so that we can spread out and members of the public can be there and be spread out. Um, knowing that we'll have to be masked um, to do that indoors. Uh, and knowing that we'll need to have a hybrid option that makes for a credible space virtually for, for members of the council and the public who don't feel comfortable uh, in an in-person environment uh, now. So those are the kinds of conditions we're talking about um, to see if that's possible. And before we, we wanted to literally like poll you to see how many of you would be up for something like that. Um, but June, go ahead if you have a question about that. Thank you. And I appreciate you taking the question, David, before the poll. Mm -hmm. I wonder if somebody could explain what the assumed value of this in-person meeting is. It escapes me. Uh, we are in a pandemic and I, I do not understand. So before I vote, I'd like to understand what the case for it is again, because I certainly understand the case against it. Yeah. 
Yeah, case against is very clear, I would agree. Um, and the case for it, instead of me doing it, I would, you know, I'd welcome members, perhaps of the steering committee. We spoke about this for a little bit. For those of you who feel that this um, is a compelling argument, there's a compelling argument to try to do some, uh, at least one piece of in-person work to wrestle with the trickiest issues. Maybe you can share that thinking. Um, and I, I have some opinions too, but let me just hold back for a sec. Um, steering committee members, as, as we talked about it, you know, how would you answer June's question? Why is this really needed? That wasn't exactly my question. No? My question was, what is the case for it? Yeah, what is the case? Needed. I don't concede that it's needed. So I'd like to hear what the case for it is. And I hope the answer isn't so I can read body language. Okay. Chris Campany. Yeah, I think I'm one of the I'm one of the ones who suggested it. And it's not to read body Did you language. want to read body language? No, well, no, but it's just the. I mean, I just came back from uh, for, as a northern chat meeting of the Northern New England Chat of the American Planning Association. We just met. We're masked, but there is frankly a difference in engaging in a really in depth discussion, discussing policy issues and other things of import when you're actually engaging with one another face to face. Um, yeah, we can keep doing the Hollywood Squares, that's fine. Um, if folks are uncomfortable meeting in person, I mean, I'm not thrilled about it myself, um, but I just feel like we're at a point where we're dealing with some pretty heavy issues that there is benefit in engaging as humans have for millennia now. But, um, but I'm up for not meeting in person too, if folks are opposed to it or concerned about it. Um, but I did know, I, did, I, I just did witness, you know, over the past week, what a difference it makes to be back in person again and have these kinds of conversations. Thanks, Chris. Does anybody else want to have some thoughts about this? They want to share who feel strongly one way or the other? Kelly? Um, so I understand that I understand the idea for having in-person meetings and being able to have conversations better that way. I found that in my own business, but as soon as you make it hybrid, which I also think is a wise idea given people's comfort levels I, and, and have the people who are in, in person have to wear masks. I feel like we lose the whole point of it because then some people are trying to understand what's going on in a room with a bunch of people with masks and they're on a video call and the room with a bunch of people in masks has to also be aware that there's a whole set of other people who are on a video call that aren't physically in the room. It starts to feel like it's too messy and it, and it sort of defeats the purpose of, of being in person if we hybridize this. But I'm in favor of not having to make everybody go in person like one would feel very uncomfortable with doing an in-person meeting with that many people in the same room, even if we're all wearing masks. My two kids are not old enough to be vaccinated. And so trying to make really safe decisions for them. Thanks, Kelly. Yep. Sue? Yeah, I would um, just second the concern about hybrid. It's so difficult to make a successful hybrid. And if we are if we were to make a decision to meet um, all in person, that would need to include the public. And I think, first of all, I personally feel that we are in a global pandemic and should do, continue to do everything we can to not be together, sadly, as that is. I absolutely agree with you, Chris. When I go into my office, I get all kinds of energy and I gain far more. But um, we're deeply in the middle of this and there you know, I happen to have a 92 year old mother who I care for. So maybe I feel it more as does Kelly with babies, but um, just imagine if someone unknowingly carried and spread and that is happening all the time. So that's always my go-to. What if, what would we feel afterwards? So that's my feeling on this topic. Any other reflections? I do want to run the poll. It'd be very interesting to see what how it shakes out here. Um, but any other reflections before we just do a quick Zoom poll about? And again, this will be a, a honor system because I don't have a way to make it just the council members. But Erica, 
Well, just a, a quick kind of piling on here. Um, the in order to uh, get a room where there's lots of room and even to hold a hybrid meeting, it's going to take you know from a state perspective, you get a contract for that, and if you don't have to contract for that, you still have to find a space, secure it, get it set up, and frankly, like I'm just looking at our uh, lovely Jane and Marion's time. <laughs> they are working so hard just to keep these virtual meetings on track. Um, I wouldn't want to like, if, if we can, unless we, unless it's a slam dunk that it's a guaranteed better um, meeting and that we're going to resolve lots of issues just by virtue of being in the meeting in person, I think it's probably not really worth the time. And, you know, like the juice isn't worth the, worth the squeeze as Ben Rose likes to tell us. Thanks. There we go. Jane? I do just um, appreciate that very much, Erica. Um, and I do want to say that just for context, um, first, um, I have called VTC and um, Vermont Technical College in Randolph does have capacity to support this kind of a meeting in a large space. Um, with Zoom and response with capacity to also have a hybrid meeting. So um, I feel relatively comfortable that we could find a location that feels central um, and has capacity to support a large group and the public if they come. Um, and then second, before we move to the poll, don't need to do this, but happy to if it would be helpful. Um, I did post um, with the agenda around this topic um, the idea of sharing with the council the arc of the next six weeks in recognition and appreciation that um, November 16th is uh, one meeting that we're flagging for an in-person, but also recognizing um, that we also wanted to flag that our substantive meeting on the, on the comprehensive draft is targeted for the Tuesday before Thanksgiving. So we also have a second poll today to try to check in about how many counselors are going to be able to meet on the Tuesday of Thanksgiving, because that is the date of the comprehensive draft. So happy to share the arc of the meetings if that's helpful, or just can highlight that um, November 16th is the only day on our agenda that has flexibility for conversation. And November 23rd is really the day where you get to see the whole plan. I think Jane, it would be helpful to look at that arc of what are the next meetings from now till December 1 so everybody knows what's to expect and then let's test the appetite on the uh, in-person aspect of that. Yeah, so um, thanks and I'll try to do this fast as I know you all have seen the slide. Um, I tried to provide just from here forward um, getting rid of previous meetings and tried to provide some clarity around language and expectations at each meeting so folks can feel comfortable with what we're asking them um, for the, to come to these meetings prepared to do. So just want to appreciate that today um, was a day off um, from reviewing components of the Climate Action Plan. Um, it's the last day of that, um, and we are trying to build forward the framework and expectation that um, all the meetings from here on out will bring forward the components of the CAP as outlined in the CAP outline that I shared with you um, on Monday of this week, along with the CAP drafting process that has very clear expectations around um, the timeline for when you already receive documents, how they will be discussed both in written form and at meetings and then the turnaround for how documents will be posted that reflect um, the track changes that were made as well as a clean copy so that if we've done our job well, recognizing that consensus and adoption hasn't occurred, but that we've elevated any contentious ideas, issues that we want to flag, that when that comprehensive draft comes forward on November 23rd, um, hopefully there will not be any um, unexpected components of the plan that counselors weren't made aware of um, ahead of time. So um, today, after today's meeting, um, this afternoon or early tomorrow morning, um, I have now all of the components um, that are expected for you to review prior to next week's meeting. Um, thank you so much to um, Counselor Jerry Duval and TJ Poor and others who have worked really hard to get those in on time and also got feedback from their subcommittees 
And most of those documents are um, for next week, um, all of those documents for next week are components in the introduction section of the CAP and related to the science and data um, components and underpinnings for the inventory, the cost of carbon, social cost of carbon, and um, that, I think that's it actually, <laughs> yeah, but I may be missing one. Um, all of those documents um, will be posted today along with revisions to two of the four sections that you discussed last week. I only received, or nor and do we discuss, substantive comments to two of the four uh, documents that were reviewed last week. So all of those will get posted this afternoon. Um, people can review those, see the changes that were made, and hope, um, hopefully they'll speak to comments that you heard at the meeting. Um, next week's meeting um, will focus on um, science and data. Um, that And that expectation will be that not only will we review the components of the CAP associated with the Science and Data Subcommittee, but we'll also bring forward um, some action items next week associated with the carbon budget, recommendations associated with that, that will get posted um, soon as well, um, as well as the um, question that came up at the last council meeting last week around proportionality and the base year um, for which we're doing um, and setting our expectations around emissions reductions. And there was a group of counselors who met um, and put forward a recommendation that cross sector will take up. Um, the following week on November 2nd, um, that meeting will be focused on cross sector and the final modeling in which supports cross sector. I do need to set the expectation now that um, the timeline is too tight for cross sector. And so that is the one um, place where I'm seeing that we will not be able to give counselors a full week to review um, the documents associated with cross sector. They really just need one more meeting as a subcommittee and that occurs on Thursday of next week. Um, and so those documents as I flagged in this timeline will be posted the Friday before the meeting on the second um, in order to give you three days, but to review ahead of the meeting but just a reminder that these meetings where we're taking back up the actions and the drafting from the subcommittees will not be where we're adopting those actions. They'll be uh, the meetings where we're still recognizing and flagging any conflict or places where we don't seem, seem to have consensus for what will um, be our open-ended meeting on the 16th where we'll come back to them. Um, the following week is Rural Resilience and Ag and Ecosystems. Um, all of those meetings will be posted on, uh, all those components of the CAP will be posted on November 2nd um, and then discussed on November 9th. Um, all of this is detailed and associated um, with the CAP outline. And what I do want to say is I'm sharing the slide to share the arc of the meeting now with you all, but the CAP outline, which I shared earlier this week, has all of the due dates the lead drafters um, associated with it. So this slide is really just for today. Hopefully you won't need to look at it and cross-reference the documents anymore. So finally, um, the 16th um, is where we'll come back and think about um, cross-cutting pathways and flag any sections that need review and consideration and hopefully be able to reconcile place, um, areas of conflict and then continue to march forward to the final comprehensive draft, which will be circulated um, for uh, on the, that, hopefully, I think it's that day, or the next day for review on November 23rd. So there is, I, I just, the recognition and appreciation of in-person was um, just to highlight the unbelievable tight timeline that we're on um, and know that it feels often like there's more air in a room to lean into conversations and have thoughtful discourse, um, especially when and where we're lifting up um, challenging topics for us to include in the Climate Action Plan. So that was really the recognition of the 16th as the space to do that and the only space really in the schedule to do that. And so um, we'd love to hear still just based on a poll what people think, um, but if we can't do it, um, we'll figure out how to do it to the best of our ability over Zoom. A pause then. Great, okay. So um, so that's it, right? That's our getting to December 1st. Those are the, the, the times we have. Let's do a quick Zoom poll. Again, this is gonna be uh, on our system here. Uh, and uh, and uh, maybe Cameron, if you're able to just launch that poll. Um, and so you'll see 
if uh, or if I can launch it if you want me to. Okay, there we go. You guys should be able to see it, right? Okay, so again, let's just do counselors. And I'm actually gonna do this again with other people who might be observing our meeting today. But first let's do it with just counselors. So on our system here, folks, um, <clears throat> just counselors. Let's see where we are. And I think I'll do, um, we'll do it, we'll run it one more time after the councils has been able to do this with everybody else who might be attending our meeting today. So counselors, Take a look at this. I think we've got maybe one more counselor here who hasn't answered yet. Okay, great. Cameron, can you show the results of that, please? Jared, it's, it's um, go ahead and share the results. Uh, this is 17 result uh, respondents. I'm hopeful those are 17 counselors. Uh, again, this is not scientific, folks. We're just trying to take the temperature of the room. Uh, you can see the results there <clears throat> where a majority of you would be virtual if we did it. Uh, another quarter of you have your doubts. Um, and less than a quarter or about a quarter um, would be enthousi more enthusiastic about that. Okay, so that is far from a ringing endorsement, <laughs> we'll put it that way. <laughs> I'm interested, uh, Jane, did you put this in twice so we could do it one more time with the, with the public? No? Sorry, no, I only put it in once. <laughs> okay, let Let's me just, take a quick picture of it. In, I did do uh, a Zoom poll, so that was great. <laughs> yeah, well done. <laughs> so, um, I, sorry members of the public, I'm not able to do that. Maybe when it's time for public comment, if anyone makes the comment about that. Um, Thanks for that. Okay, so I, I, these are things hard to do in real time, but I certainly what I'm taking away from this is not a lot of enthusiasm. Uh, and on the contrary, some, some doubts. And so it raises the question of how to make that 16th meeting feel powerful and interactive and good, um, and maybe invest a little more time in it to give a couple of breaks in it. Okay, um, great. Uh, I think that kind of settles it, honestly, folks. Uh, although Cameron says he can uh, he can relaunch that poll. And so I'm just interested to give members, observers who are with us today, this time council members, hold back. Don't click on this. Cameron, if you're able to do that quickly, that would be helpful. Um, and to relaunch the poll. I'm just interested for folks who are observing us today, how they feel about it as well. So if you're observing our meeting today, this is your chance to vote in here. Um, counselors hold back from voting. If you're observing today, just go ahead and click on that. That's great. <clears throat> I'll give you a second to think about it. Again, this is for observers today. Thanks, everybody, for doing that. I'll just give it one more second for folks to vote. Okay, Cam, go ahead and share those results. This is uh, 13 people from observers, uh, and frankly, it's fairly similar results. In fact, a little more, uh, yeah, frankly, a little bit more enthusiasm, but only a little. Uh, okay, thanks. I'll take a screenshot of that too. <clears throat> All right. Um, so I think that's pretty clear, folks. Um, thanks for, for that clarity of message there. Uh, we wanted to do one more thing around the 23rd. Um, as Jane mentioned, that's Thanksgiving week. We know some people travel, <clears throat> take time off um, because of Thanksgiving. Uh, this is a Tuesday afternoon meeting, just like our normal Tuesday afternoon meeting. Um, I understand, Jane, you actually did a little poll on that in, the, in Zoom. Uh, and so Cameron, if you're able to launch that poll on the December 30th, this is just for counselors, folks. Uh, so just counselors, please. Um, and this is, will you, this will be obviously virtual, uh, but will you be able to attend a virtual meeting on November 23rd, um, the Tuesday before Thanksgiving? Again, the agenda for that meeting is reviewing a full draft, um, uh, comprehensive plan. Thanks, Jared. That's good. 
I'll give counselors just one more minute to click on yes or no for this. I've got 15 responses. <clears throat> got 16. Okay, Cameron, why don't you go ahead and share? Great. So we'll definitely have a quorum um, for Thanksgiving week. Thanks, everybody. Um, uh, appreciate that quick feedback. All right. Um, <clears throat> okay, so that's what we had planned for just hey, David, now. Yeah, go David, ahead, please. That, yeah. We may have a quorum, but that's 13, that 13%, 13 that, that's how many members out of the total? Uh, that's a good point, uh, because it was only 15 who, or 16 uh, who responded, if I'm, so we have close to a quorum. Um, 16, so we have 14 members. That is technically a quorum. 14 members of who is here right now said yes. So that- but How many people said they couldn't? <laughs> two. Only, only two. Okay. Two of the 16 who responded just now. Okay. And again, it's a little bit unscientific because it's full honor system that it was counselors answering. So I, I, I wouldn't, Bet my life on this, but I'm just saying, as a temperature check, it looks like we have uh, uh, enough folks to to be with us. Okay. Okay. Um, that's all we wanted to do before public comment. Unless there's any comment, counselors want to make about um, again this sequence of meetings that are coming and how we're going to be handling ourselves in the coming weeks as we move to this. Uh, getting the comprehensive initial um, climate action plan together. Any final comments about this sequence of conversations and how we're going to be working together? Okay, great. Um, great. So, Excellent. Annette Smith from the public is uh, got her hand up. And so, yes, let's do some public comment. Please go ahead and use the hand raise function in Zoom. If you're having a hard time with that, send a chat message to let us know you want to speak. Um, and uh, Annette Smith, go ahead, please. And Thank feel you. free to open up uh, your camera if you want to, your choice. I can do that. Um, I want to share some comments that are camera didn't work anyway. Um, observations about the, the public process in general. I'm, I'm concerned that what this climate council is getting is kind of a feedback loop. Um, I think that there are some groups in Vermont that are very good at turning out people and they turned out to get the legislation passed and the uh, meetings, the public meetings that were held, I think probably were the result of uh, some efforts by groups to turn people out. And then the, the slide that you just saw uh, with public comment input form, I did take a look at that, uh, the public comments uh, a few weeks ago, and it looked to me like someone was mounting a campaign to get uh, certain groups to weigh in. And, and we see this at the Public Utility Commission was when there are contentious rulemakings and uh, you'll get uh, over a hundred comments that all pretty much say the same thing. So I, I'm concerned to see a slide like that that looks makes it look like it's a numbers game. Um, in terms of the demographics, I mean, I, I got reports from every person who attended the, the per, in-person forums. Um, I didn't go to the one that's about 15 or 20. 20 minutes from me. The reason I didn't go was because it's my chore time and I milk a cow. So that makes me wonder, okay, how many farmers were actually uh, involved in this? And then I think about some of the recommendations that are gonna be coming out of this that are gonna require contractors. So how many plumbers, how many uh, electricians, how many uh, you know, tradespeople have actually been included in any of these discussions? And my guess is very few. I mean, my work right now involves a lot of land use, both Act 250 and the Public Utility Commission. And I heard somebody say the word today that you know, their experience that everybody's just drowning. And I think that's probably an accurate 
uh, portrayal of the current social anxiety that's going on with way too much way too much happening it's it's you know winter's coming on we got to get the firewood and we got to get uh, you know I, I was out digging potatoes for part of today um it's just again i will say it's important to be realistic and um i think recently i attended the just transitions uh subcommittee and uh again made the point that i think i could offer some ideas on public outreach and somebody there said they would contact me and nobody contacted me. Um, the other thing I wanted to comment on was, uh, I think Secretary Moore's comment about what you're heading into in the legislature is important to keep in mind. And I'm not sure how you incorporate it, but um, Act 250 has been, uh, you know, bubbling up for quite a while. You're coming into the second half of the biennium, so there's not a lot of time. Uh, there's pressure to get something through in Act 250, and frankly, just on that, there's not enough time. Uh, and then you add this on top of it. Uh, on the energy side of things, you've got uh, both the net metering uh, program and standard offer kind of hitting a wall and needing a new, uh, a whole new uh, program, and I don't know how that's going to fit into what's happening with the Comprehensive Energy Plan or uh, the uh, the Climate Action Plan. But there aren't very many people on, and are not on very many committees, who are going to be challenged to deal with what's on their plate, and also what uh, they are expected to do anyway as part of their normal normal work. Um, I did attend both of the online public. Uh, meetings. Uh, I attended the first one uh, and was put in a room with two other people and nobody taking any notes from the uh, Climate Council. Uh, one of the other pe people happened to be a state senator, so it was very nice to have 40 minutes with two other people and we had a very nice conversation, but nobody reported out. And so there's no record of anything that we talked about. Um, there's also some outreach that's being done by the Speaker of the House and uh, the Senate pro tem president, and I participated in one of those, and I've seen reports on other ones. And, you know, there are issues bubbling up that are very clearly on everyone's radar, and I think one of the top ones is housing. And so, in a way, you're going to be competing with some urgent social needs that, uh, you know, while I recognize the climate's changing. I mean, I've been dealing with this for decades too, uh, as a farmer. I, I do, do think that I just am again cautioning you to scale back your uh, idealism and focus on what is realistic to bring to this legislature at this time when our, our whole planet's in crisis and uh, to have reasonable expectations about what can actually be done and set aside things that are not realistic to get through in a re reasonable period of time. So thank you for taking my comment. Thank you, Annette. Thanks so much for sharing those comments. I see a hand up from Abigail. Go ahead, Abigail, please. Hi, can you hear me? Yeah, absolutely. Oh, excellent. Great. Um, thank you so much. My name is Abigail Giles, and I'm a reporter with Vermont Public Radio. And um, I actually had two questions. Um, I was curious if the council um, is collecting demographic data about who um, is being reached and who was reached and who's submitting um, public comment um, throughout this process, and if that will be tracked. Um, I'm not sure if it would be more helpful for me to give both questions now or just start there. <laughs> I, I think probably give both questions because I think we're, we're probably not going to get into a space of answering questions right now, but I think okay. put them out there and then we'll make sure you get in touch with the right people to answer those questions. Sure. And then I'm, I, I suppose um, my next question was going to be um, thinking about the event last week, um, whether there was a plan to uh, address that and to re-engage um, and, and was curious also about how many people were originally signed up for that session that they have um, not participated with the reschedule, um, but happy to follow up about that offline as well. Thank you. 
Thanks, Abigail, for those two questions. Like I said, I don't think we're going to get into a space of answering questions right now, uh, but I really appreciate you putting them out there. And I think I'll make sure uh, Jane or others follow up um, to make sure you get those questions answered. Um, uh, and Jane just put that in the chat right now. Thanks, Jane. Perfect. Um, I saw another hand. I think it was from Stephen Crawley, or, or, but now I don't see it. Oh, I do see I'm it. Here. Yep. It's matching with your beautiful leaves in the background. So. Oh, yeah. They're, yes. Well, uh, uh, thanks. Uh, I appreciate the discussion that happened today. A lot of uh, you know, really important thoughts came out. Um, I just want to say, don't beat yourself up. That's my point here. Um, I think that the work that the council and the contractors have done on outreach is outstanding. Um, it's not perfect. It, there are flaws. Um, but, you know, you think about other uh, think about your regional plans think about your town plans think about your clean water plans and your air plans and your comprehensive energy plans when do you ever do this kind of engagement to pull people in it never happens um so you've been charged to do that in the law and that's great because it's that kind of a problem it really affects everybody where they live and it's important to engage everybody and and it's been pointed out that the you know the underserved people are, are the ones who get, uh, you know, who are most at risk and all that. And that's all very important. But these principles really should be applying to every single government action that ever happens. Right, it should be, it should be part of the regional planning process. It should be part of uh, when you're doing clean water plans and you just go right down the list. It should be everywhere and it's not. So what you guys have done with this is really outstanding. At the same time, I think I would agree with those who say it's not enough. And counter is a learning process. You know, build it into the future. Build public engagement into your plan. If you just make it part of the planning process and then forget about it, then you haven't done the right, you haven't done the job. I think that would be letting people down. But if you learn from what you've done now and build that into how you go forward, you know, this isn't going to be one fell swoop. It's going to be lots of steps going for lots of uh, rulemaking and all kinds of processes. Well, build this in to going forward. I think that's the way you honor what you've learned about this process. So that's what I got. Thank you. Thanks so much, Stephen. Appreciate those thoughts. Um, ben, it looks like you might be the next and perhaps last person in our public comment. Go ahead, Ben. I'll be brief because uh, Chris hit on a, a lot of what I wanted to say, and I think perhaps more eloquently than I'll say it, but um, one comment that uh, was made a, a while back now that really jumped out at me was the idea about how this is iterative, right? You're going to hand the baton to the legislature the, the and the you know various, an ANR through rulemaking. They're going to hand the baton to various departments and agencies to implement these things, and they're there can and should and must be significant public engagement throughout all of that. And, um, and so my comment really is, it seems like actually making in the sort of cross-cutting recommendations part of the plan, a recommendation that very clearly states that and actually puts some meat on the bones about what you all learned about public engagement and says to the legislature, this is something that you all need to take seriously as you are further developing this, and then you need to make sure that programs that you're uh, passing or expanding then also need to have this level of public engagement as they are developed and uh, in more detail. Uh, so it just feels like that, I mean, that would be one way of continuing, as Steve was saying, to do this critical work of engaging the public. Um, and then the other thing that I would say, um, I had read the, the public engagement plan back in, um, I think it was late July that it came out. And I, I just uh, looked back at it and it strongly implied, maybe didn't out and out say, but my, the impression I was left with uh, was that there would be a public engagement process post December 1st, that there would be a, you know, a new version of, not a, a new version, but a further refined and built on version of the plan in early uh, 2022. And that, you know, it, it tracks with the comp comprehensive energy plan. And I think it's something that Vermonters would expect to be able to react to something and, um, you know, have it be then further revised. And 
um, as someone who does a lot of work in the legislature, and this is the last thing I'll say, the kind of timeline that was laid out there, delivery early March, that actually is not too late for that to have a real impact on how things are actually built in the legislature. That's halfway through the legislative session. One body would have the full benefit of that revised plan. So I, I really do hope that's something that you, uh, you know, do carry forward and have a, an additional public meetings and additional uh, survey post uh, December 1st. So thanks for taking the time. Yeah, thank you, Ben, appreciate it. Okay. Um, any other folks <clears throat> who are observing our meeting today that want to comment? Okay, great. Okay, some additional food for thought there. Thanks to those who commented from the public. Um, always helpful. Um, that's the end of it for today with us. And I actually apologize. We managed to do uh, a pretty long meeting without a break. And so... <laughs> Uh, we won't do this again uh, to have such a long meeting without a break. Um, anything else, Jane, that I'm forgetting or others uh, <clears throat> before we wind up today? No? Okay. Great. All right. I think we're done. Thanks, everybody. Really interesting conversation. Take care. We'll see you in a week. There's lots to read. Please read. <laughs> There's lots to read. It's on the website. Um, <clears throat> very important uh, that we're doing that reading before each meeting. And this week we have a full week on these documents. It'll Jane will give us a heads up when it's posted and ready to go later today. All right. Take care, everybody. Have a good afternoon. Thanks, everyone. <laughs>